you can see the program of my talk on the board, and I will start with a commercial. So I don't know if you have heard about the initiative, which is called HIST Era. HIST comes from challenges in information, sciences, and technology. And there are European countries that make this HIST Era program. And actually, I, 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 I was a couple of days ago, I was in Helsinki at Histera meeting, and we discussed two projects that uh, will be published in October 2018. So they are, they are just being prepared to be announced. And one is analog computing for artificial intelligence, and another is intelligent computing for dynamic networking environment. Are you fam uh, familiar with what is Histera? and how it's paid. So this is European program, but it does, it's not paid by European Union directly, but countries that make the consortium decide if you, they like to join the program or not. And the finances for a program are paid at the level of each country. So actually you submit your proposal in duplicate to, at the country level and in Europe. So if the uh, European uh, consortium accepts your program, then I don't know if the country is forced to pay or not. And, well, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this, this type of, uh, uh, in participating in this analog computing, and to, the program needs participants from at least three countries, three different countries of Europe. And I, as I can see, well, Poland decided to pay and confirmed bulk action, but Portugal is to be announced. So if you like to be in the program, use your pressure, political pressure on administration in Portugal to join these programs and uh, officially <laughs> be part of it. Okay, so this is for commercial. I, I, I stopped my presentation about self-organization of uh, information processing structure, and as uh, Peter mentioned, within Noinoi project we were able to do something here. So, to make droplets covered by a lipid layer that were in uh, uh, organic oil and they contain busy solution, and I, as you could see, they were interacting. Okay, so I'm, I, I continue with this project, what you can do with busy droplets. So. If you don't mind, I sit because there are, I'm going to show you many things what can be done on this level. Okay, so we have information processing droplets, and let me use this movie. Does it go? Yes, it goes. So you can see two droplets <laughs> containing busy reaction. Okay, I was pushing this one so you could see they are mechanically stable and you can see white waves, but there are about maybe two millimeters in diameter, and you can see that excitation passes from one droplet to another one. So actually we have communicating droplets and we can try to make a computer out of, of, of such droplets. Here is a much nicer picture. Well, there's a full story. I invited a guy from Hyrox company in Japan, and they demonstrated in my lab what they can do. And this is so-called 3D microscope. So on YouTube, if you check Hyrox, Hyrox and BZ, then you find a nice feel. Okay, so we have droplets, they communicate. Is there any engineer? Can we force them to uh, self-organize? And here you have a couple of droplets there are on another organic substrate, so they will group together and to observe what's happening to, oxi uh, to excitation in this droplet. Now, at, the, at, the, at the very beginning, maybe I will start the film once again. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. I should go with the page up and down. Yes, so observe that at the beginning, excitations of those droplets were pretty individual and next they synchronize. So, at the beginning, okay, this is a fast guy, those three are synchronized, this is completely 
individual, or that, that's something rotating here. And yes, and now I think this guy is controlling the rest of, of the system, so it's actually sending information around, around those, all, all those guys. And now I think this one became a pacemaker, and there is a way of propagating from left to right. So it's a, it's a kind of dangerous effect because after a while the system synchronizes and it's synchronized by the most frequent oscillator you, you can find in the system. And I will show you how to find against this effect. Anyway, what we found it nice that the, those droplets are self-organized into hexagonal structure and well, we can group them together. That's one of the results coming out of this Noinoi project. And th there was the idea of uh, <laughs> sub-excitable droplets. I I've shown you that droplets uh, that, uh, uh, well, excitability means that we, I can excite a wave in the medium. Whereas sub-excitability means that this wave it's not stable, or the, the, the pulse I excite is, is not very stable, but at least it's stable at the distance similar to droplet parameter, uh, diameter. And here we have a regulator model of Bielus uh, of Jabotinsky reaction. This parameter phi here is illumination, and when you change illumination, when it's low, the system is excitable. So if you excite here, then there are snapshots of position of, of the excitation pulse. The excitation pulse moves from here to the other end of the droplet. If you increase illumination, then it's more difficult to expand for a pulse, but it still expands. Then there is a very narrow regions, region of illumination. You can see that this is well fifth decimal place. You should be very precise to set illumination when there is just a propagation of non-expanding pulse from one end droplet to another, and when you exceed it, then the excitation dies. Having such droplets, you can try to make logic gates. And here is the idea. So let's start with this one. This guy is a droplet, the, 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 the droplet with this circular, circular uh, pulses is the droplet that's permanently oscillates. So it's oscillating droplets. All the others are sub-excitable. So this is the source of excitations. Then here is, uh, what is this? Let me see. Uh, now, oh, here is just a channel, I think, because it's, it's nothing here. Uh, ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, I was wrong. Uh, so, uh, so this system represents an end gate. If the, this droplet is permanently excited and sends signals, those signals pass to another droplet, pass to another droplet, but they propagate uh, parallel to this junction, so actually nothing happens. So if we have, if the state of this droplet is zero, because there is no source of excitation in it, the state of the droplet is one, zero, one, goes into the state of C droplet zero. And similarly, if we excite this droplet, but do not excite this one, then this droplet is never excited. However, if there are permanent excitations of A and B droplets, then the pulses meet here, are a bit reflected and excite, the droplet C. So with sub-excitable system, you can make logic gate. And here is more complex structure in which one means that this droplet is permanently excited. So, OK, so this is 0. So this is uh, XOR gate works with such design. So there is a permanent signal coming from this droplet, permanent signal coming from this droplet. Here is one input, here is another input, here is output. And you can see if there are signals coming from this and this droplet, okay, they meet somewhere here, but they do not excite the output. If there are two signals, uh, if there is a signal coming from a droplet, so this is zero, uh, one state, okay, the one would be for, he, for this, this is in zero state, 
then those signals combine and die at this end of the droplet, but the signal from one propagates to, to, to output droplet and generates an output signal here. So, well, you can, you can watch what's going on. Those I remind that A, B are the inputs. If you can see droplets expa uh, excitation expanding from one of the inputs, it means that its state is one, and those two droplets are additional droplets that are always on. However, there is a trick here. Actually, you have to synchronize this droplet, this droplet, this droplet, and this droplet to get this action. So, alone, we have a nice theoretical idea how logic gates should be constructed. It's not easy to, to arrange it in practice. So, I, I'm going to tell you about something else. We can make droplet system using microfluidics. And, excuse me, I, this movie is large, so I have to show it directly. I make it faster. Oops. Maybe that's two times the speed. So I have friends who work for microfluidic department, and they are pretty clever to select different types of oils. So actually, we mass product two droplet systems, or oh, they can do many droplet systems as well. And yes, so there is one oil, another oil is encapsulating a pair of droplets, and then we have a pair of droplets, uh, a pair of busy droplets inside such single encapsulation. What, what is for? Well, that's more for experimental studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we produce, must produce many identical systems, and you can see that they are communicating, and we can say, for example, what is the firing ratio uh, in, uh, of, in such system, I mean, how it depends on the volumes of soft droplets containing busy reaction. Anyway, it illustrates that we are able to produce, uh, mass produce systems of droplets. But next question, what to do with them? Shall we go for logic gates? Surely not. So I will show you another idea of using chemical computing. So, oops, where we are. come on. Yeah, okay. Well, so first message is that what you usually observe in uh, uh, busy droplets is not an excitability. Do you remember, during my previous lecture, I, I have shown that if you have a medium, you can put a wire, and this wire, let's, let's say in the case of labyrinth, or in the case of Petri dish, excited waves around. But it's very difficult to use wire in the system of droplets as, 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 as a way to excite them. Why? Because it's a silver wire, and droplets are covered by organic oil. So actually, the silver covers with uh, a layer of organic uh, of, of hydrocarbons, and uh, it's insulated. So actually, it doesn't attract any bromine ions, and it doesn't make any excitations. So you can forget about excitable droplets. And actually, what it's easy to get within uh, droplet system are the droplets that self-oscillate, excite, interact, sending pulses, and so on and so on. But there are self-excitations. Uh, self so you should change the strategy. You shouldn't use uh, um, excitability as as the way to introduce information, but you should rely on oscillations. And we wrote a paper, I haven't shown it uh, during my previous talk, and I won't show it now, but we, 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 we have illustrated strategy, how to cut information in frequency of pulses, not in the presence. So, so it can be used, but it, we, we, we started just uh, logic gates, so it's not especially useful. Okay, 
But the nice thing about droplets is that you can control them. And if you have a good student, in this case, well, uh, was Konrad Giżyński, who is my postdoc right now, then he built a computer-controlled system in which we use blue diodes and then fibers, and we can illuminate droplets individually. And here is his experiment. Here is the result of his experiment with two droplets. So actually, how to read this? This is so-called space-time plot. So actually, each droplet is... Um, OK, maybe I go back to, to... Oops, I go back to show what's going on. So here there is a space-time plot. What does it mean? We draw a line on, 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 on our movie and analyze colors along this line. And one by la one, lines are placed... Uh, well, the, the line corresponding to T1 is at the top, then to, uh, at, 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 at slightly longer time is the next one, and so and so. So actually, all the movie is analyzed by cutting uh, by, by colors along this line, so there is a space and time plot, and you can easily see how the uh, pulse propagates. So it starts here, and if it goes down, it means that it propagates from one end, well, here, as you could see, from this end, to the other end of the, uh, of the droplet setup. So what is shown on, on, on those space-time plots are just the positions, time-dependent positions of uh, excitation pulses uh, in the system you're studying. So here we have a similar uh, space-time plot, but here we have just two uh, 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 droplets, you can see that this curve is slightly bended, which means that excitation appears at the center of the drop first, and then it expands towards the end of the drop. And it's easy to understand it, because actually excitation means that the concentration of activator is pretty high. And at the boundary, activator can escape to the oil phase through lipid layer. So, uh, due to this escape, the concentration of activator at the boundary is slightly lower. So, it's typical that in the droplet, excitation appears at the center, and then it expands to the sides of the droplet, and it's nicely reflected. Okay, then this is illumination. Illumination, as I told you before, generates Br- ions that inhibit the reaction. So, you have oscillations, then we illuminated a droplet, no oscillations here, and then oscillations after switching of illumination, oscillations were re-established. So actually we can switch off and on oscillations using illumination. Okay, so there is another trick. Let's consider three droplets. And, uh, well, we control the droplets by, by, by a computer. And I'll show you the movie of this system. OK, so we have three droplets. Now, uh, the droplets, OK, there's one, second, and third droplets. They are in a plastic cage. So those, those, the, those are plastic. They are actually, well, pillars cut it from optical fiber to stabilize the droplets. Uh, double layers can be seen here. And on this droplet, you can see that this area is slightly lighter than on the other droplets. Yeah? This is violet, this is also violet, but this is slightly whitish. So it means that oscillation, uh, excitation, this droplet is excited. I will run this film, and you will see I think of excitation rotating counterclockwise. Yeah, so, okay, so this droplet gets excited. Don't, don't, don't. Yeah, now this one, this one, this one, this. I don't know what they are doing. Are they doing something? They get excited. Anyway, we illuminated the system. And now, this droplet is dark, so it's it, it should get excited first. Then there is another one, there is another one. And then we have 
rotating excitation wave uh, in the system of three droplets. And actually, we did an experiment in which the re we were able, by, by clever illumination, we were able to reverse the direction of uh, rotation of this wave. And we found that it's very stable. So actually, you have a memory based on three droplets you can build. it, But it's still far away from computing. So finally, we, we've got the idea, Peter started to talk it, how to, which kind of problems can be solved with droplets, uh, and I, I tell you about. So our medium, our computing medium, is an array of droplets of different geometries. Well, actually, we are now doing some experiments. What I am going to show you is mainly theoretical study on, on those arrays of droplets. So you have computing medium made of droplets. Uh, the control of this system, so uh, the definition of the problem it's supposed to solve is uh, given by external illumination, blue color, says for how long you illuminate as a given droplet in this system. Uh, so if there is white color, it means that this droplet is not illuminated at all. Dark blue color means that this droplet is illuminated for almost all the time we perform the experiment. The time is crucial. As I've shown you, with the system of droplets that self-organize themselves, uh, after a while, all of them get correlated and were for oscillations in them were forced by a single droplet. So this is completely useless for information processing. Uh, what is important in our approach is that we observe our system for a specific time we define. So we assume that the medium composed of droplet can solve a problem. Uh, we assume that the output information is delivered by number of oscillations of a selected droplet within the time we assume it's supposed to do. So you can say, OK, maybe take, observe the system for three minutes, observe the system for five minutes, or whatever. But we do not assume what, was, what is the basis of chemical computation I started my lecture with, that we are searching for stationary state. To me, sorry for this word, it's a bullshit. Information processing should be done in a finite time. And waiting up to infinity for the state of the system, OK, you can get some information out of it. But this is not, not the right approach. So we specify the time, and we say, OK, number of oscillations at this guy, uh, at this guy gives us information about the problem. Then uh, we select some droplets as input ones. So the information is introduced as uh, illumination of those selected input droplets. And the other droplets in the system are a kind of program. So we illuminate them uh, for a specific time in order to get the desired action of, of this medium, the desired number of, of oscillations. So input is the information introduced by illumination to input droplet. Control is the illumination of other droplets, not input ones, in the system. And output is just a number of oscillations in a selected droplet. OK. So this is our assumption. Our assumption is such system can perform, infor uh, can process information, believe or not. OK, this is more or less what I have told you. Ah, what kind of, oops, what kind of problems we're we are going to solve? Maybe this, this, this is what I'm, I'm supposed to tell you first. So we consider database classifiers. 
And database classifier, for example, here is Wisconsin Breast Cancer data set. It contains several hundred records. Each record represents two types of cancer, two types of cancer, a cell with two types of cancer, and actually in this record we have this number of cells in which cancer is not dangerous and the, 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 the other represent dangerous or form of cancer. Don't ask me what are the inputs. Okay, they are related to the shape of the cell, the thickness of cell, uh, layer, well, there are some other, the size of the cell, actually the base is, is slightly larger, we selected three predictors, and here is the, can the cancer type uh, that corresponds to, to, to the value, uh, to, uh, to a given case that was studied by, by medical doctors. Uh, and the goal is, well, can, can we do the classification of this database with chemical, with a network of chemical oscillators? How we do it? Now remember, those numbers are between 0 and 1, or between 0.1 and 1. So actually, we introduce, we select a droplet to be an input of the first predictor, we select T start and T end and illuminate this droplet for the time from zero to, okay, this time that depends on the predictor value. The output information is extracted as the number of uh, oscillations within uh, the time of experiment. Well, you can, you can ask, okay, yeah, fine, yeah, yeah, but show, show me that it works, it works. Well, of course, we, at, 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 at this moment, we don't know how it works, but we know how to optimize the system. So, actually, we have all output classes, and they make one set. Then we have a number of excitations of each droplet in the system. So, if we have set number J, we can tell for each droplet in the cell, uh, in the system, we can tell how many times it oscillated for a given uh, network of uh, interacting uh, chemical oscillators. And then we can make a joint uh, set that contains the number of oscillations at droplet I and uh, the output of your database. And now it's a simple trick uh, Peter has told during his presentation. We are trying to locate the droplet which, for which the number of oscillation is in the best agreement with the output of the database. How to do it? Well, that's, that's a bit complex. So you need genetic or evolutionary programming for it. So at the beginning, we generate droplets. Then we make recombination, randomly selecting the best. OK, we identify the best ones. Uh, if I have a network in which I specify where are the input droplets, uh, how long I illuminate the other droplets, then in such network, I can study the evolution of such network for all the cases in the database. So actually, there, there is a bit of computing. So for 700, circa 700 cases in the database, for if I select a network, so for all 700 uh, cases of the database, I have to study the time evolution of such network. And then, uh, I consider all droplets as potential output and select the one for which the mutual information is the best, is the highest, and the mutual information with the output of database. So this is my output droplet, and if I uh, have, let's say, 100 networks, then I reject 40% of them, and then I, I select, well, in the algorithm we are actually using, we select 10%, 10 top percent 
the, of, of networks go to the next generation, and they can recombine with those not very good ones, but the others. And the recombination is that we cut part of the network and uh, mute, uh, combine it with another one, and then we can perform uh, mutations of the positions of input droplets, and yeah, and we also mutate the time uh, used for introduction of the input information to the droplets. So actually, there is a lot of uh, optimization of, of such network, but it can be done with, within a reasonably short time if you use event-based models. Now, nowadays, well, my collaborators are struggling to get NVIDIA working. Actually, if there is anyone, has any one of you practice with so-called NVIDIA P100, Pascal 100 board? No, okay. I would love to share experience with it. <laughs> Learn something. Uh, anyway, okay, so we have, we have a simple model of, of oscillations, and yes, this is what you got. So after some optimization, this system of 16 droplets, here is the illumination, so the program, here are the input, performs in the following way. If you have dangerous form of cancer, then this droplet oscillates, well, four, three, two, well, with some probability five times. If you have uh, not dangerous form of cancer, it oscillates six, seven, eight times. So we can introduce a cutoff and say, okay, this is a classifier. And this classifier, if the number of spikes, if you introduce the parameters of your cancer into the network, if it, this output droplet oscillates four or less times, well, the, cancer, the form of cancer is dangerous. If it oscillates five, six, or seven times, this is not dangerous of form of cancer. Okay, that's, that's the result of training. Well, you can say, okay, but you train it. Oh, that's, that's, that's a bit of scaling, so as you would expect, larger networks perform better, but they are harder to optimize. I don't, I don't come to this point, but I would like to say something about predictive power. So we decided to make an experiment. We took this original data set. There we separated it, selecting 50 cases in each class, and this is our test data set, and we train it on 600 remaining cases. This is the result of training, so the, 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 the network is slightly different. The training is random, and surely we haven't appro approached the limit of this, of this network. Oh, yeah, I should mention it, you see. We, it's like teaching a student. You may teach your student to be a Nobel Prize winner, but, well, it can happen that the student is not able to learn everything. So we do not assume that this system can be trained to classify your database in a perfect way. We assume that it's imperfect way of teaching, but we believe that after sufficiently long optimization, we reach the limits uh, up to which this system can work as a classifier. So we repeated uh, training on the data set, achieved 98% of accuracy, and then we moved the same strategy to the cases this system knew nothing about. And yet, almost 90% of accuracy for the cases the system hasn't been trained for. So, is it a chemical computing? To me, this is the right strategy. Forget about logic gates, okay, they are nice, but if you like to have something practical, maybe this is the approach. And, okay, well, 16 chemical oscillators is not a problem to, to construct, and actually there are other oscillating systems, not BZ, you can use. So, we repeated it on a stupid program, Ah, that's, that's, that's a called spare problem. So you have, sorry? Uh, I have a question. Uh, if 
Yes, 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 please. So I, I have um, a question oh. regarding, so, so it seems like what you're doing there um, is learning a type of network which yeah. finds an equilibrium when, it, in terms of, uh, let's just think about abstractly in terms of energy, finds some sort of equilibrium when a few inputs and outputs are in place. Um, yes. Which, which there's some architectures in machine learning which are very similar to that. Well, we do not change architecture. Architecture is always this. Yes, yes. So that, that's my point. So there is a few architectures in machine learning which are similar to that. In, 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 if we just think about neural networks, for example, you can mm -hmm. configure the network in many ways. But w one thing that, that it's there, which, which I find interesting, is that, um, and I don't know how much implication this has, is that some of those, let's call it, some of those droplets have uh, four neighbors, others have three neighbors, and ha others have two neighbors. Yes. So there's some structure there which yes. is given by the, the layout itself. Yes. Um, so my question is, what would happen if you had different layout, a different we, lattice? We try hexagonal lattice and we try uh, triangular lattice. And actually, okay, triangular lattice, generally I think my answer would be that if you have more neighbors, it helps to achieve higher accuracy. So triangular lattice, I mean the lattice in which one droplet has just three neighbors, is inferior with respect to regular one or hexagonal one. But um, if you compare hexagonal lattice with this regular one, there are not so many differences. So maybe, well, 0.1 or something like that but in accuracy you, you can get. But did you observe any sort of specialization? Like, for, for example, this may sound ridiculous, but let's suppose that inputs are always at the borders, which may not no. be the case, but no, no, there was no, no specialization. No, no, no. We, we allow the inputs to be anywhere. So during the process of training, we can consider there is a certain probability that each droplet uh, can become a neighbor, uh, an input, and we do not exclude the case in which, by random chance, an input of one of the predictors is just vanishing. So we allow optimization of all the parameters here. I think you already answered this, but uh, can we model this as a base network? Sorry? Can we model your system as a base network? Well, we have a model. I mean, this is based on mathematical models because you see, if I run, okay, this, no. this system is optimized for about 1,000 generations, maybe this one for 500 generations. And in each generation, we consider a population of about 100 or more of networks and each network is tested for 700 cases. So we use the approach in which we use computer simulations to optimize the network, and then we, what, what is currently, well, my, my, my fellows are doing in Warsaw, we select a couple of cases and see if real experiments confirm assumption of our. Uh, strategy. But there is no way to run experiments and based optimization on, on experiments. My question then is, how does this compare with normal classification, uh, with the normal computing classification algorithms? Oh, did, you, did you compare? You, no, I haven't tried. Maybe Peters knows something about this particular database. But to me, Okay, this is something, because you see, I can write a perfect classifier uh, that works in the following form. Give the number, give the values of predictors, search the database, and read the answer from the database. If the database is complete, you can consider, for example, logic gate as a kind of database, then everything is fine. But if you have a large database, uh, sorry, not too large database, that doesn't include all the cases, then you are in trouble what to do with the cases that are not included into the, into, uh, the training database, how to treat them. 
So I can easily write an algorithm that perfectly classifies this, this training set, but I need to make assumptions what to do in the, with the cases outside of the data set. I haven't tried it for, for, for this particular database, but what I can say is that this bloody system, I would say, without my knowledge, is able to find correlations in this database in a pretty correct way. That's what I'm astonished with. Do you have any other? Come on. It's not mine, I believe. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, so I, I will show you just one more example. Maybe not of predictive power, but of the system we studied. Here, with uh, the cancer data set, we're limited with the cases that are given in the literature. So, uh, well, there were 700 cases published, and I really don't know how they were obtained. Let's ask medical doctors about it. But we can build a simpler database, and this is so-called sphere classification. So, we consider a unit cube, and we consider a sphere that is inscribed inside this cube. And, well, there's slightly higher probability, the volume of the sphere is slightly higher than the volume, slightly larger than the volume of remaining part, but not too much in three dimensions. And, uh, well, we classify, well, we, we consider two by two, three by three, four by four, classifiers of this data set. Why, why we selected this data set? Because it's very easy to generate such data set on our wish. And here is the results of, of, of classification, and actually, well, you can classify the points inside the data, uh, uh, inside the, the uh, sphere with the accuracy exceeding 80%, which is not bad. So actually, this, this network sees the geometry of points inside, inside three-dimensional cube. But uh, what is more important, after training for 500 generations with uh, a population of about 1,000 cases, we can test this classifier uh, at very large their data sets containing hundreds of thousands or even millions of elements because they can be very easily generated. And the message is that it's sufficient to train the network for on, well, a few hundred cases, and you got uh, objective evaluation of its accuracy for circa 5,000 cases. There is no much difference between 5,000 cases and 100 or million cases. You consider when with a million cases or 100 cases, uh, 100,000 cases, you, you can think that the problem is really well covered. So, 80, over 85% of accuracy, such, such, such network can, 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 can give you such a network. Yeah, well, that's, that's a question. Uh, we, we tested what happens if you remove one sphere, and there, there are, of course, spheres that are, can be easily removed. For example, this one, because it's, it's illuminated for all the time. And there are spheres that are more crucial. We, we, we are not removing the input ones. We just delete one of, of, of the other spheres. And so, so actually, the system works in parallel. And this is a nice feature I would like to have in uh, systems. OK, so maybe the conclusions are that evolutionary algorithms can be used. You can get such accuracy, and we are like extending it to the other networks. and. Yes, the other conclusions may be okay. That chemical classification seems to be a promising approach to chemical computing. That's the fact. And there are problems, still open problems. What, is, what are the best coding? Maybe you, you can invent more efficient coding uh, strategy for chemical devices. What are the optimum self-organizing opt structures? I'm, I'm, what I can do in, in the lab are just 
interacting droplets, but maybe the other structures I, I was showing, those um, uh, double diamond structures are, are better. Uh, this information can be answered with our approach. So actually we can study how uh, the accuracy of, of a given system depends on the number of, of, of droplets involved. Well, uh, and I would say that four by, for the problems I studied, four by four system is sufficient. You really don't get, gain too much and optimization time is much longer if you use five by five or six by six or different geometry. Well, that's another point. In, in a real brain, you have long distance interactions between neurons. Here we stick with yeah, uh, the nearest neighbors. And there is a problem how to switch off and on chemical computer. So what I can see is that if we develop the technology of those chemical classifiers, they have one very nice feature. They are autonomous. They do not need a power. Okay, you can say the, the, the observer is needed to count the number of uh, oscillations. But actually, some time ago, we developed, um, we proposed a, a counter of pulses that is purely based on chemistry. So you can, you can imagine that such, well, network can be incorporated somewhere that the excitations or the control on oscillators in, is performed chemically without the influence of electronics. And the output is also chemically extracted as, for example, a given type of molecule. And if this type of molecules is observed, then an, an action is uh, uh, by the rest of the system is performed. So, so maybe this is the direction to go. And finally, I would like to thank many people who were involved in, in this study. Yeah. So that, that was the project Peter mentioned, and there are other people who are, who are with me in my lab. Yeah. So thank you very much for your attention. We'll uh, give the uh, stage to Peter, but if there's any question you want to ask now or later. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, but I'm not sure if I completely got it, but in one of the last slides about the toy problem, uh, where you can see that the fitness uh, increased over the training generations, it seems that during most of the iterations, it basically doesn't really change the fitness, but there's like a, a couple of very large increases. Like in this graph, there's a huge spike around the 120 or so, the on 120s. You mean this jump? Yeah, that, that means that it suddenly got much better, right? If I understand it correctly. Uh, okay, uh, yes, there are two curves. So one is average of overpopulation. I don't remember how we did this calculation, uh, but of course it's possible that the average overpopulation drops if, if you generate too many unsuccessful uh, classifiers. But what is, okay, here we use another strategy, teaching strategies. I think no, uh, well we can, we, we, we use two types of strategies and both are related of with biology, so in one strategy, you keep the parents with the children, or at least the best parents with the children. And in such system, you get a monotonous increase of uh, fitness because you never lose the best candidate. The, 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 the most fit uh, classifier can withstand many generations. But here, yeah, obviously we use another strategy, and this is like in insects, that parrots produce offsprings and die after. 
And w was it analyzed why there is such a sudden jump? Is it like just random? Oh, or? yes, it's random. It's, it's just we're lucky to, to yeah, get yeah, yeah. Okay. something that was very fit. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm, I'm curious on your um, idea or your conclusion that it's autonomous. Uh, I'm wondering where the activation energy for the oscillation comes from, because as in any system, I imagine there's um, energy dissipation through a... No, 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 no. There is, there, okay, this, this reaction, uh, well, the thermal effects on this reaction is, 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 is quite small. But um, if you want mind, I switch into another presentation to answer your question. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, you haven't paid for the most. Yes, I know about it. But we got the old one. Okay, so here we are with Bielusov Jabotinsky reaction. And you have this excitation is related to concentration of, of this type of molecules. They are not ionic, so they can penetrate to the barrier. A lot we, we made in a precise experiment, and actually some ions are also can also penetrate to the lipid barriers we are using. Anyway, you can see that this reaction is autocatalytic. So from one molecule, we get two molecules. Of course, those molecules are consumed in other reactions. But anyway, if you have sufficiently large concentration of those molecules, then this autocatalytic process is, generates the, the excitation. So actually, if you see a wave It's easier for me to do it while I sit. Okay, so this white stripe, this white line, is the area, ah, that nicely shows that those droplets are mechanically stable. But this expanding white line shows the area where, well, it's slightly, uh, okay, it's roughly speaking, it shows the area where concentrations of this HBO2 is large. So if, okay, it's, it's large here, and here is the contact. So some of the molecules migrate to the other droplet and generate the excitation. But it has nothing to do with thermal effects. Uh, yeah. Um, th thank you. Uh, just one uh, last one. Uh, if you leave a droplet that is oscillating in a dark room, say, theoretically, I don't know if you can then measure it, uh, for an infinite amount of time, what, happen wh what state does it uh, end in? Oh, it ends usually with the red state. And so uh, it depends on, on, on initial concentrations. Uh, so sometimes it can take, uh, well, half an hour or an hour of oscillations and then it dies out. But this is not the full story. We use malonic acid uh, as a substrate, as an organic substance. There is a variant of uh, we have also Jabotinsky reaction with so-called CHD. I, well, this is cyclo. Okay, it's a cyclic molecule. You see, I'm, I'm a theoretical physicist, so well, organic chemistry is, is not my favorite subject. But you have organic rings, and I think two oxygen molecules at the top and at the bottom. Um, if you like, I can find it on, on, on one of the slides. And we, we discovered that those organic molecules, the CHD, can be dissolved in the organic phase surrounding droplets, and it actually 
can penetrate, uh, can come inside into the droplet. So actually with CHD we expected to get, let's say, week-long action or whatever of, of, of such oscillating system. But the experiments are extremely difficult with this substance. So we, we haven't proceeded. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I suggest that we now um, start Peter's presentation. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Test, 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 yes. No, no, do you have a point I have? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Would you mind if I leave it? You can put your computer off. No. Okay, so the final part, just one thing, if you want to download the software for computing the organizations and also the exercise, the, it's also explained here how to do the exercise we did here in the room, how to do it with the software. It's also explained, it's one zip file, so you can just go to my homepage and in the talk and teaching area you can download it. Okay, so let's go to... This one. Okay, so now in this final part, I wanted to talk about how to select the right chemistry. We have seen different types of chemistries, and you might wonder, so why not take something else? So a couple of million molecules, or, or tens of millions of molecules in the Reaxis database, and they're of course in the world, there are much more molecules, so which one should I choose? And maybe I can make a great discovery with new types of molecules, and I want to talk about what could be the right molecules. And after that, I will speculate a little bit about applications. So, what kind of chemistry should we use? And there are, of course, many desirable properties, and I've listed here some, like it should be cheap, not so expensive, products should be stable, not uh, lasting for fractions of a second, it should be safe, there should be maybe a large number of species, Maybe if you want to have large number of species, we should be able to easy control them and easy to predict. We have seen for manual programming, we need to predict what's going on. We should be able to make what we want to program and so on. I don't want to go into detail here, I want to just show you one property. And a property that maybe, I'm not so sure whether, whether it's known or whether it's already has been measured in any kind of medium, it has been proposed, in the literature for many, 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 many years, but I have not yet seen a quantification of it. Maybe there is, but I have not just read the literature well enough. So, so what I want to show, discuss is the ability to implement arbitrary mappings as a desirable property. So, so that is, uh, so no, again, so it's the ability of a medium to implement arbitrary mappings. And I will tell you what I mean by an arbitrary mapping. Sometimes it's also called contingent mapping. Some people say a mapping that cannot be apply, uh, explained by physics, which is a bit confusing. But uh, we, will then, we call this ability to implement an arbitrary mapping semantic capacity, so it will be a property that is needed to do information processing, to do codes, to implement codes, and to do, implement assignments of things. And uh, so I will now, in the, in the uh, talk, I will use the ability to implement arbitrary mappings 
I would propose as a physical property that we can measure and that is beneficial for chemical computing. And we should also then, okay, so I will use now in the following of the talk, I will use this ability to implement arbitrary mappings, I also call semantic capacity because it's shorter. Okay, so the motivation is now, let's assume you have different media, chemical media. You have chemical media like here, a flame, that also has thousands of species inside. And you have a living organism, okay, that has billions of species inside, but uh, chemical species, but let's say you have these media, yeah, what, what is better? And I will show that here the semantic capacity, the ability to implement arbitrary mappings with this kind of chemistry is extremely low, while here it's extremely high. Okay, so, so what does it mean to be, what, what is it in arbitrary mapping? What do I mean by that? So I will operationalize this arbitrary mapping uh, with respect to molecules. So I will define it with respect to molecules. And there I call it a molecular code. This term is coming from the domain of biology and code biology, where you have the genetic code which is a mapping be between nucleotide triplets and amino acids. And so here the term molecular code refers to, mol to mappings among molecules. So a mapping is some, a mathematical thing. Yeah? A mapping, you have a set, you have another set, and you have assignment between these sets such that any element of one, one set is assigned to an element of the other set. So that is a mathematical thing. But now I say a molecular code, I define with respect to some kind of medium, some kind of chemistry. And I say now a molecular code is a mapping, which is a mathematical object, but between molecules. So I go to the domain implementing this mapping. So it's a, <laughs> it's a mapping between molecules real by, realized by other molecules. So it's basically a mapping that can be implemented by the chemistry. So I use the chemistry as a computer to compute this mapping among the molecules. But, uh, you know, I mean, there are many, many mappings, of course, but now th there are some map of these mappings, they have this property, they are arbitrary. And this property means the mapping can be different by changing the molecules realizing it. And by different, I mean between the same sets of molecules. So you have the same domain and codomain, so the same sets of molecules, but you can make a different mapping among them by changing the molecular context around them. So let's illustrate this graphically. So assume now we have some chemistry. So that is just the illustration. So you have just some chemistry. And now you can use this chemistry uh, to map molecules. So this is a set of molecules, a set of molecular species, I must say. Set of molecular species. That is a set of molecular species. And this is a mathematical mapping I want to implement. I want to impl map this molecule to that molecule and that molecule to that molecule. And I use a context. Yeah, I use a couple of other molecules to implement that mapping. And now the mapping is arbitrary or contingent if it's possible to find another kind of context such that the mapping is changed among the same set of molecules. Okay, then I call this mapping contingent or arbitrary, or I call it molecular code. And, uh, oops, what? Okay, wrong button. And now I want to basically operationalize it. So because I want now to study, I want to study now different chemistries. And I want to study how well can they implement these arbitrary mappings. So I must formalize it. So I will show you now the form, form, how to formalize it. So again, we use reaction networks, and you are familiar with this. So for example, this reaction here means A1 plus E1 reacts to form E1 plus B1. So you can think about E1 is a catalyst that converts A1 to B1. So you have a reaction A1 plus E1 goes to E1 plus B1. Yeah, and then you have a network like that. Okay, that's an example that I now want to use to illustrate the, the, the contingent mapping. So now I want to show that this type of, this is now a mathematical mapping. So we have now a set and another set and we map A1, A2 to B1, B2. Yeah? And now I want, obviously we can now implement this with our reaction network and um, formally, we, have, we do it by uh, yeah, mixing the molecules and then computing, then letting the molecules react. And formally, we can do this with our closure operator that I introduced uh, an hour ago or two hours ago. So basically, closure is the operator that, pr that adds all the products that I can make with these molecules. So when I take these th three molecules, the closure is basically everything they can make including them, themselves. 
And you can see this when I take A1, E1, and e, E2, then B1 is produced uh, eventually. So the closure basically generates all the possible products. It simulates the reactions going on in the vessel. Okay, so that's a closure, and now I can define, okay, uh, now we use now this, com I mean this chemistry, to implement this mapping. So now, first, before I introduce an arbitrary mapping, I introduce what is a mapping, a simple mapping that can be implemented by the chemistry. So, given two sets of molecules, X and Y, so you see it here, that is one set of molecules consisting of A1 and A2, and another set of molecules, B1 and B2, that's the second set. So I now want to implement the mapping from X to Y, and I say it can be realized by the network if, <laughs> okay, I want to implement that mapping. So if I can find a context of molecular species, like this, this is an example. So if I can find, so we can find a set of molecules C, and I call them context, such that for every molecule X from, my, uh, from this set here, I, uh, I can now mix, I take now this X, I mix it with my context, I compute all the possible products, and now my value that I want to compute must be contained in these products. Well, I mean, straightforward. And of course, for every other molecule, X prime from X, it should not be, not be in these products. Yeah, otherwise, I don't know what I've computed. Yeah? So, I, so I can compute now by putting my X inside my context solution. I wait, I check what kind of element is here inside, and it should be one of those and not both. Yeah, then the computation didn't work. Okay? So now, if I can do this, if I can find such a context, then I say I have been able to implement a mapping. So then I've been able to implement that mapping. Yes. So now we, we come to the arbitrariness. So the arbitrariness now means, or the molecular code now adds arbitrariness to this mapping. So the molecular code is a molecular mapping, so you have been able to implement that mapping such that other mappings from X to Y, let's say other non-trivial mappings, from X to Y can be also implemented or realized by the network. And you can see this here in this example. We can, of course, use now this context, so we can use this context to implement the alternative mapping between A1 and B1 and B2. Yeah, so, so far, I think that is now the, now you can say, okay, yeah, that's easy. So now let's ask, are there other molecular codes? Now the exercise could be find all possible mappings that are also arbitrary. So now, okay, no, I have to do this. Um, yeah, so let's see whether I can do this. So I now want to show you uh, maybe another mapping that we can make. So maybe another map mapping that we can make. Uh, oops, another mapping that we can make. So for example, we can take now the, uh, we take A1 as a context. So now this is our context. This is our context C. Okay, I'm sorry for the colors. And now this is one domain, yeah, E1 and E3, and I map it to B1 and B2, yeah? So I can now implement a mapping from here to here and from here to here using the context A1. <laughs> can you see that? <laughs> So maybe a bit ugly, yeah? So I can now map E1 to B1 and E3 to B2 by using A1 as a context. Yeah? But now this mapping is not arbitrary. It's not a molecular code. So you cannot change the mapping by changing some molecular species. So it's a physical consequence. And that is where this idea of yeah, a code is not explainable by physical laws coming from. So this kind of mapping, E1 to B1 and E3 to B2, can be inferred using physical laws and using just the molecules, E1, E3, and B1, B2. So you can infer the code from the signals. Yeah? So you can infer the, the relation from the molecules involved 
Yeah? But the other mapping, that the, the contingent mapping or the arbitrary mapping, you cannot infer from the molecules, from the signals and the meaning that is going on. That is like in the genetic code, where you also cannot infer using the physical laws how the, amino, how the nucleotide acids are mapped to amino acids. So, questions on that, how that works. So, so now we can, I mean, I will not do this exercise here, but you can now ask, so which of those molecules has more contingent mappings? Which kind of systems? And as I told you, the number of possible ways a system can implement molecular codes is a semantic capacity. And interestingly, this kind of network has more abilities to implement contingent mappings or arbitrary mappings. Just to show you, I mean, these are the ones that this can implement and so on. So now, now that we can now, given a reaction network, we can compute the number of possible ways it can implement arbitrary mappings. We can now uh, look at real chemistry and look, so how about real chemistry? Okay. So now look at the semantic capacity of different chemistries. And um, so and, and we can not only measure the semantic capacity, we can also ask what is the mechanism how these systems implement the arbitrariness. Because this arbitrariness in, is at the heart of uh, information of symbols, of, of semantics, of, of, of meaningful information processing, this arbitrariness and learning. And so you can also ask, how, what is the mechanism? How do they implement this contingency? And we will see now, and, and we can now look at different types of systems, yeah? We can look at translation, gene regulation, signal transduction. We can go to Mars, look at uh, photochemistry of Mars. We can go to the flame, so here I have some flames. And we can go to artificial chemistries, I will not t talk about that. So just, I mean, it's in a way obvious, of course, when you go to the, to the DNA genetic code, uh, genetic code, what is it? The genetic code is a mapping, so it's something mathematical. The genetic code is a mathematical structure. It's a mapping between triplets and amino acids, yeah? or, or, or triplet species and amino acid species. So, and th there's a machinery that is a context that is implementing this mapping. And of course, we can then uh, see that this mapping is rather arbitrary. There are already in living cells, there are a couple of different mappings between the same species available, at least 20, I think. And also people manipulate or change the genetic code artificially. We can change this in living cells. So it's possible to make different mappings between the same sets of species. So I will not, uh, so that is now how it looks like in the molecular code. It's in a way obvious, yeah? So then maybe we can look at translation. Translation, oh no, what is that? Transl I, want to, I want to look at translation, please. So why, why is there, I, I looked at that already, okay. Oh no, okay, so I, we, can, I, we can look at gene regulatory networks. So in G, how, how do gene regulatory networks look like? You have DNA, that is DNA. You have a protein, let's say a transcription factor. The transcription factor binds to the promoter region. And as a result, the coding region is red and the product is generated. And you can now see that the mapping from the transcription factor to the product is contingent or it's an arbitrary thing. You cannot infer it from the transcription factor and product alone. It's not possible. And this, this can be changed, I mean, genetic engineering, you can change it very easily, extremely easily. And uh, now, the interesting thing is now, the DNA is the context. Before here, in this, in this kind of system, in the molecular code, the DNA is in the, is, let's say, here in this domain, yeah? So it has changed its role. So that is what I mean by understanding the mechanism of implementing the contingency of implementing the arbitrariness, we then understand that there are different systems interacting and that have different mechanisms of implementing the contingency inside the cell here. Now the DNA has a different function here, namely making this programming the relationship. Okay, so now you, we can look just briefly at signal transduction networks. So you might ask, is there also contingency? And actually, it has been, I, I've not, oh, I'm sorry, I should have showed you that, uh, I mean, this idea of contingency is an old idea. And for example, Jacques Monod is discussing it. And 
especially, for example, in membranes, proteins, you have it. And, but I want to look inside the signaling cascade, inside the cell. So you have a, typically, you have things like that. So you have uh, enzymes reacting back and forth. So you have an enzyme that gets phosphorylated by some other uh, molecule. Yeah? So A gets phosphorylated to become B by some kind of kinase S. Yeah? A typical element in such a signaling cascade. Now we can say, OK, so if I have S, I get a lot of B. So we have a mapping between S and high level of B. So how about that mapping? It's not a code. It's not a contingent mapping. It's not an arbitrary mapping, because it's determined by the physical structure of S and B. So you cannot change this so easily. I mean, and so that means that this is this mapping. So the mapping between S low, or let's say S high and B high, this is not an arbit contingent mapping. Yeah, so, how, but but is there contingency or arbitrariness? Yeah, there is. So we, you just make two steps. When you make two steps in this phosphorylation cascade, yeah, for example, S activates the B, the, the A activates the D, yeah, if you make such a cascade, then the relation between the S and the D, so the, this mapping from S to D, yeah, from here to here, that is arbitrary, because the cell can reprogram the mapping here. Yeah? So you need a two-step uh, system to get the arbitrariness inside this. Then maybe we can look at Mars. So let's travel to Mars. We take some of the atmosphere. It's a photochemistry. And we, uh, I mean, people have made models of that. So there are models like this, 103 reactions, 31 molecular species. And we made a tool that, can, that looks in the whole network and looks for all possible subnetworks that have that property that I showed you. So the tool finds really all of the molecular codes, so all of the possible contingent mappings in this network. And there are 100 reactions and 31 molecular species. Uh, so, and the number of molecular codes here is uh, none. So there's no way to make this contingent mapping. So you can make many mappings, but none of them is uh, contingent in the, in the way, or arbitrary. Same in combustion chemistry. So these are the combustion chemistries we looked at. So you see here the number of reactions, the number of species. So they're pretty large systems. Uh, and also there, there are no molecular codes. So, what you, so there's no single mechanism as I showed you before. So there's no way to make this arbitrary mapping. And uh, of course, we have to take this very, very carefully. These are just four models out of billions of models available. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's just a very tiny amount of data that we have used here. But at least there seems to be a rough tendency available. So, so there's a high semantic capacity in these biochemical things and a low semantic capacity in these atmosphere and combustion processes. So you might then put some, some hierarchy here, yeah? And you can then say, okay, there's low in these networks and a high semantic capacity in these networks. So from that we might, uh, we, oh, oh, okay, so I might say now, uh, before I conclude this semantic stuff, so this type of definition of arbitrariness can be, of course, generalized to other kind of signals. So for example, spatial signals, or other type of signals like continuous changes of concentrations. And you can then also define a contingency or arbitrariness for that kind of system. Yeah. OK, so let me just conclude here. The semantic capacity, so the ability to implement it can be quantified in a way. Chemical systems possess different semantic capacities. We have seen, when we studied the different things, like that it is really good to look at biological systems. And especially DNA, we have seen, is involved in, in chemistries with very high semantic capacity. So it makes a lot of sense to look at this DNA kind of chemistries, and especially also, of course, at other molecules from the living world, because it seems that life I would not say want it, but life seems to, I mean, seems to try to get access to chemistries with high semantic capacity. When you look at the history of life, you can see evolutionary transitions that led to systems with ever higher semantic capacities, yeah, including neurons and maybe even computers. Okay, so, and it was low in atmosphere and combustion and high in biochemistry, yeah, that was I say. Okay, so... So for this part, let me finalize. So 
I'm just checking my time. I, I've done my time here. Well, this is enough. Yeah, yeah, because now I move to, I mean, okay, so now I, uh, I move to, or do you have questions now on the semantic capacity part? So I now want to, part, let's say, speak five minutes about heavy speculations about potential future applications. It's a so-called SAPFA model, but okay. So, okay, let's start the speculations and then, okay, so just roughly, huh? what, what kind of potential applications do we see? Of course, there's one area called molecular robots. We want to build small molecular devices that act like robots that have some autonomy inside. And these molecular robots, I think, of course, I'm not in this domain, so I cannot say how far the domain is really is, but I think they, they have real implementations. And um, these implementations, they can navigate. They can go somewhere, and one application domain is drug delivery. So I want to deliver a drug to a particular location, and that is what is really important for these robots to do. And of course, what we want to do is we want to add computational abilities in these robots. We want to add uh, cognitive functions in these robots. We want to make, add decision-making in these robots. And I told you chemical computing is slow, and that doesn't matter here, of course, because we have time, and we also only want to make simple decisions, and that would be really an uh, application area where this is really useful. Another one would be smart molecular factories. So the dream is to uh, produce molecules uh, in one pot, yeah, or to produce molecules in, let's say, uh, in a small device. So currently, when you produce, uh, compu when you produce chemistry, chemical things, you have the computation separated from the chemical process. So you have an in silico computer that controls the process. So you want to integrate that and maybe put the computing, which is not very much, you want to integrate into the chemical system so that the chemical production is itself controlled by a chemistry. And then you would need, let's say, very basic elementary computational properties at the molecular scale. And if this is even programmable from the outside, you could have even personalized smart molecular factories yeah, when you can program them from the outside. And that is also a domain where you don't need high computation power, but uh, some computation power, but at a molecular level. Uh, smart materials, I mean, that is basically a similar thing. Yeah? You want to make smart materials. The, the domain is about self-healing materials and so on, but you could also think about materials that compute to do something yeah? and you, that you can program. Another area are these develop developmental systems. I think also Luca has uh, talked about that. So that you want to make some system that develops out of a simple genome and it creates some structure. And during development, you have uh, some very basic uh, computation going on, measurements and decision making is going on during development and you want to make an artificial molecular developmental system to create some program structure. Yeah? And inside this process, you also need computation, decision making that is localized and it's also not that you want to compute, let's say, uh, uh, yeah. you, you don't need very much computation uh, to do that. And it should be distributed and delocalized. Information processing protocells, I mean, you, there's a number of groups are trying to create protocells, that is, proto-living systems. So systems that have a metabolism, that have a membrane, and that have uh, basically an, an information processing uh, polymer system that, that stores some information of that system. And of course, we want to add to these kind of protocells, we also want to add some cognitive functions. Yeah? And then you, you need some kind of chemistry to do the computation. And you can then use, I mean, the domain of chemical computing to get inspiration how to uh, add some kind of, uh, let's say, computation to these protocells. Yeah, so of course, you can also add it to living cells. It's already done, of course, in many different ways. So you, you add to us, to us, so the idea of synthetic biology, at least what I think, what goes beyond biotechnology, so many things in synthetic biology are also basically biotechnology, but what is going beyond biotechnology is that you add new computational capabilities to the cells. And uh, that basically means you put, uh, yeah, either you use already present molecules to compute different things, or you might also introduce, of course, novel type of molecules and add computational computing inside the living cells uh, that we currently have. Um, so my, uh, one of my favorite things, what I, how I got into this area, actually, was my interest on self-modifying machines, so machines that change themselves while they operate, hopefully to become something better for us. 
but uh, okay, but and I think this chemical metaphor, so the making chemical computing, is in a way uh, also a paradigm to make self-modifying devices that change their structure, that change their form, due to their own interpretation. And uh, of course, it would be. I mean, from a theory point of view, of course, you have chemistry, they are molecules, they interact on themselves, so they can change them completely, so they can change the way they change the way, and so on. And this would, in, I mean, a subdomain of the self-modifying systems is the idea to make self-replicating systems. So a dream would be that, of course, you buy just the device one time and then it just replicates at home uh, in the kitchen or so and make more of your machines that you need, for example, so to make self-replicating chemical computers would be also maybe one <laughs> of these application domains. Yeah, let me conclude. So we have seen that there are various exciting potential application areas maybe available for this kind of domain. And uh, there are a huge amount of challenges also for experimental people developing novel molecules, handling those molecules, selecting the right molecules, making them easily available in standardized ways. And uh, in, in biochemistry, molecular biology, uh, or physical chemistry, and so on. But also in that, <laughs> I'm coming from the theoretical domain, and I think I also showed that these systems are so complex, they are so high dimensional, and I mean, okay, of course we had, okay, so what I mean is so, there are various channel, uh, channels for formal scientists, really programming, design, and theory. And maybe just to make a point that they are very high dimensional, these systems, and we had high dimensional systems before, obviously. But now the high dimensions, they all have different meanings. Yeah? They're really all different. All these dimensions are used for something else when you think about a computer. Yeah? You cannot use a mean field approach or something like that to understand them. So you really have to understand the structure, the hierarchies. And I think that also computer science provides quite nice methods to deal with this kind of uh, complexity. So let me finally acknowledge the results that I've shown here from uh, people from the lab contributed different things, chemical, uh, Gerd Grünert, Flo Besmoyer, and also Nono Consortium with the chemical things and the, peer, the, the organizations that gave the money. Thank you very much. Especially for this last part, which actually uh, drives us into the hackathon. Yes. Lots yes. of good ideas and, and, and speculation. Uh, so we have time for questions. Maybe I should start a question. Uh, Peter, uh, yes. one, one of the things that I, I find really interesting about, about this sort of models is that we can start thinking about using uh, computers in environments which are not suitable for other types of, of, yes. of, of, of computers. So, for example, you mentioned Mars, right? Or you, okay, uh, that, yes. Or, or, or could, could we think about uh, starting to build computers that do s very simple things, some, some simple chemical transformation yes. or some physical <laughs> process yes, we yes. can interact with at the yes. very low level and send a computer like this to, to Mars to start doing something for us before we get there? Yeah. Or <laughs> I mean, explore, the, uh, you know, the... Uh, the uh, uh, seabed, right, which is super high pressure. We, we can't, we, we can't yeah, send yes. the machine there yes. because it will, will just be crushed. Yeah, so of course it would be highly speculative. I don't know what we could do on Mars with it because we can also send silicon and electronics mm -hmm. to Mars and use it. So that's easy, Mars, yeah. Yeah, and, <laughs> yes, maybe Mars would be easy. But let's say if you would have a, a molecular, I mean, maybe a trivial example would be, okay, maybe it's very trivial, but toothbrush, I mean, tooth cream. Let's say this tooth cream should decide whether we should go to the doctor or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or it, it should tell us something. Yeah, so we don't want to have electronics inside the tooth. How is it called? Tooth cream or yeah, tooth, tooth, yeah, yeah, yeah. tooth paste. Yeah, so so this I mean by a domain. Yeah, that where I don't want to have electronics inside. Yeah. For example, one of the later reactions we considered was the surface oxidation of uh, carbon uh, oxide uh, on platinum, and this is high temperature reaction, so actually it operates in s around 600 centigrades, and this is the, the region far away from uh, the temperature silicon so the chips can do the work, and you can apply the similar, I mean, the system is oscillatory, can be excitable, so all the ideas translate directly to, to such high temperature reactions. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yeah. 
So you also mentioned um, computers that could uh, self-adapt to several conditions. Could you extrapolate a little bit, little bit more on the architecture that we would need to build in order to achieve uh, those type of computers? You mean the self-modifying machines? Yes, self-modifying machines, yes. So actually, I, I would now say that nearly no one knows how to make them that they self-adapt such that they do what we want. So if the machine starts to modify itself, it will change. So it might also potentially change the way it modifies itself. And our current theory, I would say, does not tell us much about what could ha happen in that case, especially when you introduce noise, if you introduce error in that process. So, so I think the, the, the dream is that they do something useful, so that they improve themselves or they correct errors. But there's also, of course, the thing, why should they do that on the long run? So if they change themselves, why should they not change themselves such they do what they want and not what we want? <laughs> yes, but there's, I think, nearly no, as far as I know, so maybe you can tell me, but there's not nearly no, no theory. Uh, there's some fixed point theory in computer science, but not what could happen when you have error and so on. So there are some very, uh, very, uh, some small attempts, like maybe you know genetic programming, where you evolve computer programs by means of evolutionary computation. And there's, let's say, three or a couple of, a handful of papers where you try to apply the GP to itself. And you see some effect. Yeah, but I, I think there's not so much. And also the early machines, I, okay, so it's a long answer, sorry. But so already in, 19, in 1970, for example, uh, Lying has designed these molecular self-modifying machines, but he could not simulate them or check what can happen. And when you think about the pioneers of computing, they already thought about the machines that modify themselves. And von Neumann, for example, was able to modify its own code. And as far as I know, maybe there's an expert here, the Zuse, who, who made this computer with, with uh, solid state, no, how's it called? Relais in German, who made a computer with click, 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 clack, clack. Yeah, you know. Uh, so this machine was not able to modify its own code, and he said he was frightened by the idea that the machine can change its own code. So, so there's not much. Any more questions? So I think we should thank our speaker again. Thank Thanks, you very much. <laughs> So we're going to go for uh, a break, a coffee break, for about half an hour, and then we'll, we'll be back for uh, a tour talk because we, as I told you before, uh, uh, um, Professor Elvira is, can't be here because she's still waiting for an airplane. Uh, we are hoping to have here about, about 7.30, 8 p.m. If you're still here, then we'll have a, the talk. You, 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 can, you, can, you can enjoy our talk. Otherwise, we'll, we'll see what we can do but uh, we'll just invert the order of presentation, so we will be at 4 p.m. Thanks. <laughs>